going to give us right now about just how horrifyingly uh, egregious, I guess, that is. I'll leave that to you. So please welcome Michelle again. Thank you, Michelle. Do you want me to put the microphone up there for you? Okay. Thank you. Here we are. Who? Okay. Hi. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, this is a presentation that I put together as a representation of part of Robert Lyman's recent report, which uh, Robert Lyman was a federal public servant for 27 years. He was a diplomat for 10 years. He's contributed a lot of reports to Friends of Science Society. Um, when I said yesterday that I was speaking as an individual, Friends of Science Society is apolitical. So the only reason why I'm presenting this now is that so few people, including in the media, are talking about Bill C-12 and the impact on our economy and our lives will be catastrophic. So what do you do to wish something into reality? Well, achieving net zero 2050 for Canada seems an impossible mountain to climb. Um, since 1990, Canada has tried and failed to meet all of its GHG emission reduction targets. And now net zero 2050 targets are even more extreme. And you can see those over here. No, it's okay. Thanks very much. No, it's uh, just so that you can see how extreme those reductions would have to be. And if in the past 30 years we haven't been able to reduce our emissions, why would we be able to do that in a very short period of time? And if you look at what happened, our emissions have actually been flat for 30 years. So in the meantime, our population grew by 37% and every person uses more energy. So actually, we must be way more energy efficient. So you'd think that the climate activists would be cheering, that they'd be celebrating, because that actually shows that we are doing something about emissions, because if we're adding more people, but emissions are not going up, we must be doing something right. But instead, they have a new plan, <laughs> and it's a law. And the law is, to make a law, they have, uh, there are these five ENGOs on the policy brief, a new Canadian climate accountability law. That would be uh, Ecojustice, CANRAC, which is an organization of 100 ENGOs and unions, um, Equiterre, Pembina Institute, Environmental Defense, and West Coast Environmental Law. So those are all the law charities in Canada. And also this other organization that used to be, could you go back? Um, it used to be Ecofiscal Commission, and now it's called um, the Canadian uh, Institute for Climate Choices. So they're all pressuring the government to make this law. And this is a law that totally ignores reality. So you can see here, uh, this is um, a graph that Roger PLK Jr. uses. He's a climate policy analyst in the States. And he's saying this is up to 2017, but emissions are, or consumption is about the same. So he's saying that there are roughly 12,000 days until 2050. The world will use more than 11,000 million tons of oil equivalent energy in 2017. That's to reduce global fuel, fossil fuel emission by 90% by 2050, requires the reduction of one. Um, million tons of oil equivalent energy every day until 2050. 
and that and what is the equivalent of one million tons of oil equivalent energy? That's one point five times one gigawatt nuclear plant or 1,500 times two megawatt wind turbines, or 14 million times 295 watt solar panels. So reducing an equivalent amount of fossil fuels every day. Now, you know, a, a nuclear plant takes at least 30 years to get approved and built. So that's just not gonna be happening. So, but who needs, but who needs reality? when you're a tax-subsidized climate activist ENGO charity. <laughs> Bill C-12 is the proposed climate accountability law, and it's legislating an impossible dream. So millions of your tax dollars are wasted on impossible dreams. Imagine the ENGO, law the ENGO lawsuits as these impossible targets will be missed. So it's kind of a job creation, I guess, for the ENGO law charities. And Bill C-12 will make people think that these are legitimate aspirations. Most people in Canada are quite energy illiterate. Nice people, but we're really dumb about energy. Um, so there's no cost-benefit analysis that's being done. And... Uh, and in truth, the Paris Agreement is purely voluntary. The targets that are imposed are self-imposed. We are imposing these targets upon ourselves, our country, our industry. There's no binding agreement in the Paris Agreement. So we have no need for a Bill C-12 or impossible emissions reductions targets. And no need for such magical thinking. So I hope that you'll read our new report. And I think that we should start a new movement called Unfriend ENGOs. But now, when I sent this PowerPoint to Robert Lyman, he said, well, it doesn't actually address the concrete realities that this bill will impose upon Canadians. So he sent me back a list of some of these things. And he said, as shown by history, it takes at least 50 to 70 years to transition to a new energy system, even when markets are pushing in that direction. Even the centrally planned economy the environmentalists want cannot do the impossible. So the first of these two points is easier to communicate in simple terms, but we need examples that people can get their heads around to at least give some evidentiary credibility. So in spite of immense efforts over the past 30 years, we have not significantly reduced emissions, not in the world and not in Canada. And it's unrealistic to think that we could do this in the next 30 years. The effect of Bill C-12 will be only to make net zero emissions by 2050 an official target in the sense that it will be the one the federal government will have to report about. We, of course, don't need a law to do that because we already do this kind of reporting. So the real purpose of the law is more subtle and insidious. It's to declare net zero as a political target that future governments want would either have to adhere to or they'd have to repeal the law relying on the political cowardice of potentially a conservative government not to do that. And it would also give these environmental groups like Ego of Justice one more basis to argue incorrectly before the courts that governments must be penalized if they do not take all the measures to attain net zero. So the costs and disruptions to Canadians would be intolerable. Shutting down most of Canada's oil and gas industry shutting down most of the emissions intensive industrial plants in mining, petrochemical, metal fabrication, steel, cement, pulp and paper industries, shutting them all down, doubling or tripling the costs of gasoline, diesel fuel, natural gas, propane, banning the use of natural gas for heating and converting residential and commercial heating units to electricity, and we saw what happened in Texas when they did that. Big fail. 
So forcing the use of electric cars and trucks, whether feasible or competitive or not. And we don't have enough power generation in Canada for the present EV policy. We would need to build at least 10,000 megawatts more additional power generation. So that's like about eight Site C dams or Muskrat Falls. You know how over budget they are and you know how long it took to build them. Plus, there would be billions of dollars needed to be spent in transmission lines. Then we would have the doubling or tripling of the cost of electricity while sharply increasing the number of brownouts and blackouts. We would have the replacing of the electrical distribution system in virtually every community and house at a cost of hundreds of billions of dollars. And secondary effects. There would be a significant reduction in the population of Alberta. There would be similar depopulation of the resource industry dependent northern communities across Canada. There would be a large deterioration in the trade balance of Canada. There would be a devaluation of the Canadian currency with a 60 cent dollar possible. There would be a consequent large increase in inflation and the reduction in Canadian incomes and standards of living, plus a doubling or tripling in the cost of air freight and air freight costs and airfares. There would be an adding of $100,000 to the cost of a new house due to changed building codes. There would be the losing investment and jobs in many industries to countries like Mexico and China that do not impose similar policies and taxes. There would be unprecedented control, government control, regulatory control over all aspects of the economy. There would be COVID-like 19 restrictions for the indefinite future. And we would lose hundreds of billions of dollars due to the premature retirement of major energy producing and using infrastructure. So, you know, this isn't even in the headlines in Canada. Bill C-12 is not being talked about in the media. Only one person brought it up at this meeting, that was Derek Sloan. So it's a very critical bill. And uh, certainly all these ENGOs, they have thousands of followers, thousands of subscribers, and they're working hard on it every day and night with their point and click emails to their elected officials. So um, people need to think about it and speak up. Anyway, we do have a new report, the Robert Lyman report that I just showed you at the beginning of the PowerPoint. So uh, yes, that's it. Bill C-12 for net zero by 2050. Hope you read it and thank you so much. I guess if there's questions, I could take a couple of questions. Go ahead, Wes. Here's the microphones coming to you right there, yeah. Wes Taylor, this is another one of our past MLAs who's joined us. Thank you very much, Wes. Okay, if I have a supplemental, I'll do the given, <laughs> yeah, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Right, thank you. Um, anyways, it uh, seems to me that this is virtually all vir uh, virtual signaling. That's virtual, not quite right. Yeah, virtual signaling. Virtual yeah. signaling. After I said the virtual, I couldn't get that out of my mind. Yeah. Um, anyways, so what we're doing, I think we have, what, 1.6% of the carbon emissions in Canada. Is that yeah, correct? Of the, of the world. Of the world, yeah. I mean, if Canada contributes 1.6% of the world. Um, how much does China and India, which are not having the restrictions that they are increasing each year till 2030, according to the Paris Accord, I understand, um, increasing onto the net on the planet for that net gain during that time um i don't have those figures off the top of my head but we do have two reports by robert lyman uh, one is called uh, promises versus performance and it's also on our blog and it shows the relative increase in emissions that, of all the countries that have not met paris targets and won't so I think India increased its emissions something over 50%. China's went up at least 28%. Canada's went up 1%. This was to uh, 2019, I believe. Um, and the U.S. actually dropped emissions because they switched a lot of coal out for natural gas. And another report that Robert just issued, uh, which is called When Giants Arise, and he shows that 60% of the world's population is in that South Asia region. And 
they're going to go full bore on developing their nations. They're not going to listen to 11% of Western nations who are whining, quibbling about climate change. And in fact, with respect to China and our emissions, China emits in one month what Canada emits in a year and a half. So should Bill C-12 then be changed to something that we are actually addressing what they're doing in China and India and other nations rather than trying to kill our economy, but if they want to clean the world, let's clean the world. Well, I don't think that we can legislate for other countries. <laughs> but, um, well, you know, I think that in terms of emissions and in terms of pollution reduction, Canada is uh, really far ahead of most countries in the world. We've done very well on pollution reduction since the Clean Air Act with the United States from around the 1970s. Um, but, uh, you know, the difficulty in trying to legislate climate change is that other countries are not cooperating. Sure, they signed the Paris Agreement. Why not? Why did they sign it? Because they were promised $100 billion a year in the Green Climate Fund to come from the West to, to their countries with no accountability. So they were bribed into this agreement. And in fact, in 2019, in the fall of 2019, both India and China sent a note to the climate conference in New York saying, pay up. Like you guys promised us this money. Where is it? So, um, and they're not going to use it to, you know, stop climate change. They're going to use it to develop their country. Why wouldn't they? And there's no accountability. So uh, we just simply don't need the net zero Bill C-12. It's just a tool for ENGOs to continuously take the government to court. And while there, you know, then the, the Canadian government can then turn to the citizens and say, oh, sorry, we have to impose these harsh measures, but now there's a law that we have to follow. And we were just in court. So this justifies the, the things that they will have to do to try and meet these targets, which are impossible without new technology. Um, and I, I just want to add a thing. Some people say, oh, well, hydrogen is the solution because it's clean, it's, uh, you know, water. You can just use water to make hydrogen and then you have this fantastic fuel. Well, hydrogen is a, a, a fuel source. Well, it's actually an energy carrier, but in producing hydrogen, you actually lose energy at every step of the way. So Professor Samuel Ferfari likes to say, using hydrogen for fuel is like burning Louis Vuitton handbags to keep warm. <laughs> so it's a really bad idea. We've got, we got a question here, and then we've got two more, and that'll be the end of questions, or we'll miss lunch. Or coffee, at least. Go ahead, uh, Carolyn. Yeah, uh, you'll have to forgive my uh, my age and my lack of education. All I have is uh, common sense. But uh, I, I've been informed that, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Canada captures three times what it actually emits because of our boreal forest. And I'm just wondering, why is that not talked about? Um, it's pretty, like, uh, am, am I off base there and why aren't we doing a huge PR campaign like I feel like there's a lot of reasonable people in Canada and if you gave them really basic information like that, it's like why can't why can't we shove the common sense down their throats um, well with regard to the first part of the question um, the boreal forest, uh, like when trees live, they do uptake CO2. And that's why everybody's so keen to go and plant a bunch of trees. But when they die, they release CO2. So in balance, it's pretty much the same. And when they burn up, they release way more CO2. So uh, you can't really use the boreal forest as a carbon sink, except if you're an ENGO that's funded by the government, like uh, the Na Nature Conservancy, they have a project called the Dark Woods, which is in BC, and Shell is now allowing its customers to help finance this forest for carbon credits. So when you buy gas at Shell, you will pay two cents extra per liter, and that money will go to this carbon trading offset <laughs> forest called Dark Woods. And just so you know, I believe the federal government gave the Nature Conservancy $21 million of your money. Um, don't know what for exactly, can't remember the grant, but this is already a tax subsidized charity. So that's one part. And what was the second question? 
Well, that was. Ah, well, you know, we're basically this kind of the con this side of the conversation is locked out of the media. There is a great movie called Global Warning, like warning, that was made by Matthew Embry, a Calgary filmmaker. We are posting it on our website. When it was released by Super Channel, it got no media coverage in Canada. It won six. It was up for six awards at the Ampia Film Festival. Not a peep in the media. You know, so actually Friends of Science is ending up being kind of a media provider because there's nobody else in the media covering these stories. But that gives a very nuanced view of the, the whole scenario. Let's take one last question. Uh, Kevin, Kevin, you're going to miss out. Kevin, go ahead, Daryl. Yeah, uh, pretty much saying the same thing she did about the, about the boreal forest uh, sucking up the CO2. But... The, there's also the farming industry that actually sucks up way more uh, with the, the with the no-till practices. As the crops are growing, they're sucking up way more uh, CO2 than than the boreal forest, and they're not mentioning any of that because I, I, I'm sure that we are carbon negative. I think we should. We're, we're just about virtually out of time. It, it's a good point. I, the Alberta beef producers made the same thing about the beef producers were sequestering carbon as well. And I said, be careful what you wish, wish for and be, be careful what you ask for. Because when we actually realize that we're cooling, next thing you know, we're going to have the world suing us for sequestering the carbon. So let's be careful what we ask for. Let's. Uh